You are listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church, located in Sandpoint, Idaho. We invite you to come and join us as we rightly divide the word of truth and encourage one another through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is our pastor and preacher, Eric Clerk. Amazing blood. Just amazing if you think about that. The Bible says he purchased us with his own blood. Acts 20, it says we are redeemed through his blood. There's such an attack on that today, especially in the new Bibles. They take out the blood. Let's open up our Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. We are in verse 5. Last week, we looked at that great day of God Almighty, the second advent. The lightnings and thunderings and voices. It's amazing to think that you and I will see that one day from the vantage point of being right behind the Lord when we come down. And as we saw last week, what are, what are those white horses? Cherubs. Can you imagine? Have you, did you guys think about this this week? About riding one of them? You're going to have to hold on. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. You know, I wonder if they have quite a, they, they have diff, different wings and stuff. Maybe some of those wings will wrap your legs so that you don't fall out or something. I don't know. It's really neat to even just start thinking about it. Let's read verse 5 together again. Just, let's just read verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, immediately when people typically look at this passage, they go straight to this seven spirits of God. That's where they go to first. And they will immediately take you to Isaiah chapter 11 and show you verse 2 there. We'll, we'll look at that some other time. I don't want to do this injustice. I want to look at this verse. It said that there were seven lamps of fire burning. Do you see that? It's not fluorescent lamps, right? It's not like somebody holding up an iPhone and it's got the little flashlight turned on. It's, it's lamps of fire burning. It's quite visual. You can see that. Now, I want to look at that today. And this morning, I was thinking about, I was sitting down in the living room and I was contemplating this thought. When I come down in the mornings, I'm blind. So when I come down, the first thing I do I typically would go down and I would throw wood into the fireplace and then I'd play. And then after I get done with that, I'd go make myself a cup of coffee. That's when I have the household to myself. That's, that would be my preferred routine. And then I'll be sitting down and I'd be having my cup of coffee. And then sometimes Julie would come down and she, the first thing she does when she walks down, you know what the very first thing she does when she comes down? She turns on the lights. I start hearing this click, 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 <laughs> click, 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 and this lamp's going on, the light's going on. She loves her lights. But you know that, that that is something that we also see in the Word of God. What is the very first thing that God says? Let there be light. Yeah. Unless, of course, you have a mess, like the message, which just says light. <laughs> or clean up. You know, or whatever. You know, that, that's just a... A joke for a Bible, right? But the fact is, what I'm getting at is, the first thing God does is He turn, He says, "Let there be light." And it's interesting if you ponder that thought. You open up the Word of God, which brings, gives us light, and the first thing you read is God says, "Let there be light." You couldn't read your Bible if you were sitting in a pitch black dark room, you know. Now, of course, a blind person could use Braille or maybe listen to an audio book, but a, a person who, who, who sees with their eyes, who reads with their eyes, they can't read. The Bible in a pitch black dark room. So the first instruction God gives you is let there be light. <laughs> Isn't that something? Think about that. You know, you can't even need that without light. It's, it's, it's an interesting thought. And, and this morning I was getting my socks ready to, to come to church and I was pulling it out of my dress and I wasn't sure what color socks I had and 
long and behold, little Hannah walks into the room and I said to her, hey, what color are these socks? And she said, I, I can't see. It's dark in here. <laughs> she came in to get mom's Bible. And so I said, okay. And I'm just waiting patiently. I'm kind of following her and she turns the light on. And then I just heard this, this, this shriek. And, she, and I thought, man, these socks must be ugly or something, you know. But it wasn't. There was a stink bug that was sitting on, the, on, on mom's Bible, right, that she had to go get. And so she took the, got a piece of tissue and got the stink bug and got it flushed. And now it's off to, you know, where the stink bugs belong. But anyways, and my, my point being is, is that we, we sometimes don't see things that's in the room around us because we don't have the lights on, right? And the same thing is true. Today, we live in a world where there are so many Bible believers, so many Christians who are walking in spiritual blindness. They think they are enlightened. They think they are in the light. And just like a blind person sitting in a room that's all pitch black dark and, and doesn't know that he's really, or doesn't care, I should say, that he's, he's sitting in a dark room. In the same manner, these Christians today are sitting in darkness. And the, the question is, is why are they in darkness? And the answer is, is because they don't have that filling of the Holy Spirit that gives light. You see, just because you are sealed by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you in Scripture that those are two different things. And so before we, we look at the seven spirits, because boy, oh boy, that's a fascinating thing and that's some deep doctrine. And I, I'm not convinced that the seven spirits is what you find in Isaiah chapter 11, that, that those are the, the seven. I'm not convinced about that because I'm going to show you when we look at that in Isaiah 4, you see others, others you see the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. And they're not mentioned in those seven that you see in Isaiah 11. So we'll get to that at some other time. I'm going to show you what I believe those are from Scripture and why I believe that. And it's a fascinating study. It's very deep. But today what I want to do is I want to look at this lamps of fire. Now the, the, the term lamps of fire is only found in two places in your Bible. The one, it's found over here. And the other place you'll find it is in Daniel chapter 10 verse 6. And it's the eyes of the Lord is described as lamps of fire. So, so bear that in mind. We'll look at that when we look at the seven spirits because it'll fit in better over there. But what I want to show you is I want to show you where the word lamp is found in the Bible. When you begin to look at the word lamp, the first time it occurs, the second time it occurs, the third time it occurs, you, you see an incredible picture emerge. And that's what I want to look at. So turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. Let's go look at the very first time we see the word lamp or lamps appear in your Bible. In this case is going to be lamp. What is lamp associated with in your Bible? And immediately it is like one of those wow moments. The first mention of lamp. What do you think the first mention of lamp in your Bible is? What is the lamp in the Bible? It's God. Take a look at it. Genesis 15. Read for me verse 17. This is Abraham who is laid out the animals that are cut in half except the, the birds and he goes into a deep sleep and God's going to pass through them because God is making a covenant with him. Read for me verse 17. Take a look at this. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. <clears throat> and who's that burning lamp? God. It's God. Yeah. And the Lord Jesus have eyes that are like lamps of fire. Isn't that interesting? Now notice what goes with the lamp. A, a smoking furnace. What did we see last week when God came down in Exodus 19? There was a smoking furnace, right? Bear that in mind. Put that on the, excuse the pun, we'll put it on the back burner, okay? <laughs> we're going we're gonna to come back to that at some point, okay? Now, let's look at the second one. Go to Exodus chapter 25. Second mention of lamb. Wouldn't believe it. 
The second mention of lamp is, remember Moses were giving the pattern of the things in heaven to put in the temple? Second mention of, so the first mention of lamp is God. The second mention of lamp is going to be the making of the candlestick. And that candlestick is a picture of what? It's of those seven spirits of God, those seven lamps. That's exactly what it is. Bringing us back to God. Isn't that amazing? Okay, read for me in chapter 25. Read for me verse 37. I just want you to see that. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they might give light against it. Now, here what I like about this verse is it gives us the purpose of a lamp. Just simple. It's a, it's it. You know, even a child can 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 see it. What's the purpose of a lamp? It gives light. It gives light. Yeah, that's the purpose of a lamp. You don't go and buy a nice fancy lamp and stick it in your living room and leave it turned off. You you put a bulb in it, you turn it on, and it gives light. It has a function. It has a purpose, right? And what was the purpose of the candlestick with the seven lamps in the temple? It was to shoe. It gives light on the shoe bed, right? And what is the shoe blade a type of? The, the Word of God. Yeah, man, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Right? You'll see that in Matthew chapter 4. you see it in Luke chapter 4. And you'll also see it in Deuteronomy chapter... Is it 8? Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. So that's where you find that. So we see that the candlestick gives light. That's the purpose. And it gives light on the Word of God. So bear that in mind. We see these seven lamps burning with fire in front of the throne of God. And now we see that the, the thing that is made according to that pattern is going to shed light on the Word, on the bread, right? So that's going to help you understand what the purpose is of the seven spirits when we get to it later on. Go over to Exodus chapter 27. Exodus 27, we're going to find the third time the word lamp is mentioned in the Bible. Very important here. These lamps, did they, did they use electricity? Were they kerosene lamps? What kind of lamps did they use in the Old Testament? What did they burn? Oil. oil. They burn oil. Oil of olive, right? Olive oil. Let's read it. That's, the Bible is going to tell it first, just so that we know for sure. Verse 20. Verse Chapter 27, verse 20. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil and olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. Okay, very important here. Number one, what does this lamp burn? Olive oil. Okay, we see again the word light in the context. Okay, and when do they turn, the, do they turn this lamp on only at night? No, it burns always. Now that's important. They had to make sure that these lamps burned always. Now I'm going to show you what one of these lamps looked like. And as a matter of fact, let's, let, let's just take a look at another verse. If you continue down and look at all the different verses where you find lamp, you'll see that in Judges chapter 7 you see Gideon. The lamp there is compared with the sword of the Lord, which is the word of God, right? So we see that. That's a fascinating passage. That would be the next one down the list. And then some of the other ones you'll find is, let's go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, which is about the Word of God. This is a familiar passage. I bet probably half of you could quote this verse. But it's basically verse 105. What is the, the, the Word of God is a? And a? A light unto my path. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Do you guys see that there? Yes. So that is the word of God. So again, we see that lamp is associated with the word of God. So lamp in the Bible is associated with God. And then it's associated with his word. It's associated with the seven spirits and the fact that it is uh, the pattern that's made for it, to, is to shine light on the Word. So we, we also know that the oil in the Bible is who? What, what's the type of the oil? The oil is the type of the? Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit is the oil in our lamps, okay? So if I want to burn my lamp brighter, what do I need? I need more oil, right? What happens when you run out of oil? It goes out, right? Yeah. And that's exactly what happened in Israel. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 3. Let me see you one of the, the next times you find the word lamp in your Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Yeah, when you run out of oil, the lamp goes out. 1 Samuel chapter 3. And read for me the first verse. Let's, let's just read the first verse. I want you to see something here. The word of the Lord was precious. We live in a day and age when the word of the Lord is precious. Amen. Because the devil has given so many alternatives to the word of the Lord, right? The word of the Lord is extremely precious to us. Now take a look. Read for me verse 2. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, and he could not see. He could not see. You see what happens here is the high priest is going blind and he cannot see. And so one of the things that happens, just like a blind person doesn't turn on the light, the priest is not seeing the things that is happening and he doesn't see that the, the lamp is running low on oil. Yeah. Today, a lot of people, Christians, they don't realize that they are going blind spiritually blind. They don't realize that they're starting to run low on oil. The devil has given them so many alternatives to, to, to the real thing. I'm just, I'll, I'll illustrate it to you this way, okay? I'm going to just give you a quiz real quick, okay? Let's see if you can complete this sentence. Let's just, just do this, okay? I'm going to give you a sentence, okay? Let's go. Rudolf the dead knows reindeer. reindeer. You guys got it, okay? How about Frosty the Snowman? Okay, you guys got it. He knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. You guys knew the... Le how, how come we know those things? Did, did you go... Did you Songs. Did you go to school? Did they teach it to you in American history? Did they teach it to you in any other... How do, how do you even know the answers to those questions? You, you heard it on, on songs, right? I mean, if I was to go into the Amazonian jungle and I find some, some you know, person living there, in, 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 will, will they know the answers to those questions? Probably not. Probably not, right? So how come you and I know about that? Culture. It's culture. It's because you go to stores and you hear music, Right? You've learned it from songs. Okay, put that on the back burner. We're going to look at that also, okay? Let me show you another really fascinating passage about lamp. But we're going to look a little bit more about this whole thing about running out of oil. I want to show you something. Go to Zechariah chapter 4. This is a familiar passage we've looked at before, but it is so well worth visiting. Zechariah chapter 4. Here we see another prophet who sees a vision of, of the same thing. But there's something I want you to see in this passage. It's just amazing. And I see a picture here that, that represents something that is up in the throne room of God. Read for me verses 1 through 3. Now, did you guys see what, what it is described? There's a candlestick that has seven lamps on it. How many bowls were there? There was one bowl on top of it, right? And out of this bowl, there are seven pipes that goes to each of the seven lamps. Do you see that picture? And then there's two olive trees, one on the left and one on the right, right? 
Okay, let's take a look. Who are these olive trees? Read for me verse 11. Okay, what's the answer? Verse 14. Take a look there. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And we find those two anointed ones also mentioned in... Keep your... Actually, just go there real quick. Go to the Revelation chapter 11. Let me just show you this. These two anointed ones, they are called two... Olive trees. Did you see that? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to show you a picture here. This is an amazing picture this is going to show us. Chapter 11. Read for me verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Okay, the two witnesses. You see that they are called two witnesses. Witnesses, right? Okay, what does the next verse say? Verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Okay, so these are the two olive trees. They're also called the candlesticks somewhere else in Scripture, but they are the two olive trees that we, that we just saw. So these are olive, the olive trees are witnesses, okay? So if you're a witness, you and I, suppose you and I were witnessing to somebody and they, were, they heard the gospel and they got saved then what we would say is we are bearing fruit, right? Because we gave the gospel to somebody else and, and they got saved. And when, they bear, when we bear fruit and they get saved, then they too become like a tree that now will bear fruit, right? And what is, what, what, how do we know a person gets saved? They, they get filled with the Holy Spirit. They get sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, right? Circumcised. That's part of getting saved. Now think about this. What kind of fruit does an olive tree produce? olives okay and what do you make from olives olive oil okay and so olive oil gets put into this bowl okay there's one bowl on top of the candlestick like we saw right and it's got seven pipes going to seven lambs you see that in Zechariah chapter 4 now think about this when a believer gets saved where do they go they go in Christ right what do we see in the throne room of God you see the throne of God like the bull feeding to the seven lambs that's in front of him. Isn't that a perfect picture of that? I think they call it the menorah. Mm -hmm. That is the, the name for that. That's the official symbol of Israel. But isn't that something? So, so you, you take the oil and you put it inside the bowl and it feeds through the pipes to the lambs and that's what keeps the lambs burning. It's the oil. Isn't that something? And, and the bowl is like the throne of God. You see that picture? It's, it's amazing. So it's just, yeah, when does it go out? When you run out of oil? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we saw that in the time of Eli, they ran out of oil. The lamps went out, right? Okay, so I want to show you something about running out of oil. Go to Matthew 25. We know that this is a tribulation passage about the ten virgins and five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. I just want to show you something there. Yes, doctrinally it is tribulation and it's they run out of oil. How do they run out of oil? Well, in the tribulation, of course, it's the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, right? And so they run out of oil because they, they, they lose the Holy Spirit. That's what happens to them. You and, it can't happen to you and I because we are saved by the gospel of grace and we get spiritually circumcised. These people in the, in the tribulation, it's going to be different. It's faith and works. So let's take a look there. Read for me only the first three verses. I want to make an application out of it. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps Okay, take a note in the Bible. Simple, simple just application from this passage is that the lack of oil is associated with foolishness. Right. You see it? I mean, it's, that's basically what we can derive right here at this point. Lack of oil is, is associated with foolishness. Okay, go to Ephesians chapter 5. Let me show you this. 
practical application for you and I. You and I can also run low on oil. We can get to a point in our Christian life where we are beginning to fill our hearts with something else. Something that you need to understand as a Christian is that you're always going to be filled with something. You, you're either going to be filled with the Holy Spirit or you're going to be filled with something else. You can fill yourself with anger. You can fill yourself with sorrow. You can fill yourself with bitterness. You can fill, fill yourself with envy. And I'll show you a verse. You can even fill yourself with Satan. As a Christian, you can fill yourself with things that you shouldn't be filling yourself with. Fill yourself with unrighteousness. There's Romans 1.29. There's all sorts of things you can fill yourself with. But take a look here. Ephesians chapter 5. Read for me verse 8. I want you to see that it has to do with light. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. Okay, so we are to walk as children of light. What does that imply? It's going to imply that we need to have oil in us, right? Because without oil, we, we can't burn our lanterns, right? Okay, look at verse 11. Read for me verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. What's the unfruitful works of darkness? What is that going to do? It's going to make you dark. Yeah, it's going to make you lose your oil because you're going to fill yourself with something that you shouldn't fill yourself with. And in order to fill yourself with something else, you're going to have to push the oil out, right? Yeah. So now take a look at it for me, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Okay, what did we see? Lack of oil is associated with foolishness. Okay, so... How are you supposed to walk? Circumspectly, right? That knows, means you know as a circle what's going on around you. But it also means spiritually. It's spiritually. That's your walk there is your, your state. You want your state to be in such a way that you are aware of what's going on around you. You don't want to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. What does that imply? That implies that you need to be able to discern what are the, unf you know, the unfruitful works of darkness. Exactly. I mean, you can't, you, if you're not supposed to have fellowship, you need to know what it is, right? It doesn't mean you have to go study out every, you know, cult out there and study out every nitty-gritty of Hinduism and Buddhism and all that. That's not really what it's saying. It's saying that you need to know that it's not the truth. And so you, 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 you stay away from it, you know. Today, Christians are so guilty, so guilty of breaking that one when they go online and they start looking at YouTube and they get all their doctrine and their stuff from YouTube, Right? Because that is the unfruitful works of, of darkness. Okay, take a look at verse 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. That is so true for today. We are living in some evil days, right? Okay, let's keep going. Read for me verse 17 and 18. You can read both. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. You see there, there's a, different, there's a contrast there. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, right? So you can't do both, right? You can't, you can't be drunk with wine and be filled with the Spirit. You see that? There? There's a contrast there. Now, there's something really interesting. We, we're going to stay here in Ephesians 5, but I want you to ponder for a moment. Just ponder for a second. Remember what we did a few weeks ago when we looked at Revelation 17 verse 2, it says that the inhabitants of the world was made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You remember that? That's unfruitful works of darkness. Mystery Babylon, this is fables. The whole world is made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Because the Bible tells us that in the last days, you know, we, we know that many shall depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We see that in 1 Timothy 4. But we also see in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that one of the signs is going to be that they are going to heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears, right? And what is the result of that? They're going to turn away they, themselves from the truth and onto fables. Fables. Now, what you see there 
is the following. And this is very important for you to see. You're going to be facing either the truth or you're going to be facing fables. You can't be facing fables and be in the truth at the same time. Right? You can't be in both. The Bible says you can't drink from the Lord's cup and the cup of devils. You can't eat from the Lord's table and the table of devils. You see, today Christians think, well, I can have the one cup in the one hand and the other cup in the other hand and I can kind of sip from the one and the other. But you really can't do it when you sit at two different tables. Do you see what I'm saying? You can also not be facing the truth and face fables at the same time. It's going to be either or. Okay, now how's, how's the devil going to get those fables into your mind? He's going to bring it in through music, right? So when you walk through Walmart, you can hear the, the jingle about Rudolph the Red Nose, you know, fool, basically, right? Okay, so you're going to hear that jingle. So how do you, how are you supposed to fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. If you're not to, to, to fill your, be drunk with wine. Now this wine here is, can also be alcoholic wine. Don't get me wrong. It, it means that too. Okay. Because if, you, if, if you're intoxicated, you're definitely not filled with the Spirit. Right? right. But now there's this also something else I'm going to show you just now. There's a parallel between a drunken person and a person who's absolutely filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I'll just tell you that. I'll, I'll, let's just say that, okay? A person who is truly filled with the Holy Spirit of God is, is, is something that is so there that you don't see those anymore. They, it's, it's almost like an endangered species. A Christian filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Do you know that a, spirit, a, a Spirit-filled Christian, people are going to think that they are drunk. We see that in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 13. They see those Christians and they think that they're drunk in the middle of the day. That's what they think. Why? Because they can't stop babbling about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what else a real Christian filled with the Spirit is? The same way as a drunk person? They have a boldness to them. They're not afraid to do something and say something. Think about that. Another thing, somebody who is filled with the Spirit of God, they're not afraid to walk up to the biggest guy in the room and tell him that he is a sinner lost on his way to hell. A drunk guy will have the same kind of guts. You see what I'm saying? I mean, there's, there's so many parallels but, that you can make. But the fact of the matter is when somebody becomes really filled with the Holy Spirit of God, they, they almost come across as, as somebody who is drunk because they have this incredible boldness in them. Think about that next time you're in the store and you're too afraid to go give somebody a gospel tract. If you're really truly filled with the Spirit of God, you wouldn't, it wouldn't bother you. You wouldn't be afraid of it. You see what I'm saying? Now, what's so interesting is, take a look here. At, we, we just looked at verse 18. Okay, we need to be filled with the Spirit, right? Take a look here. How, does the, how do we get filled with the Spirit? So we're moving on to the next part. We can see that first part is that the lamps need oil. And in order to be a good witness, you're going to need to have oil. And in order to understand the Word of God better, you're going to need oil, Right? Then you then we said so that you can run short on oil. So how do you get that oil back? Well, good thing you asked, because the very next verse is going to tell you. Read for me verse 19. Speaking to yourselves, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Yeah. So how did Satan teach you that Rudolf the Red Nose reindeer? How did he teach you that? With a song. Well, yeah. And what does the Holy Spirit want you to how, What does God want you to do? Fill yourself with, this, with, with the Spirit of God through song. So, songs. And, and, and then when you sing those songs, who do you make melody to in your heart? So if you are singing, filling your house full of Christmas music, and you are making melody in your heart with little of the red nose reindeer, who are, you, who are you worshiping and serving? Who are you making melody in your heart to? Devil. To the devil. To the devil. Do you guys see that? Yeah. So the first step in getting yourself filled again with the Holy Spirit of God is to put the right kind of music in your ears. Amen. You see that? Okay, let's look at verse 20. Here's another one. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, 
you begin to give thanks to the Lord. How do you do that? Through prayer, right? Yeah. And through praising Him. So giving thanks to the Lord. Isn't it amazing how the Bible, just the one verse flows into the next, it just shows you how to do this. Because you know what's going to happen when you start putting the right melody in your heart towards the Lord? You're going to be filled with joy. And what is the result of joy? You give thanks to the Lord, right? It's just the one thing flows to the next, okay? Okay, next verse. Read for me the next one. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You see, you start submitting yourself one to another. And we know that from here it's going to go on to husbands and wives and we're going to get the illustration. But ultimately, we are the bride of Christ. So we submit ourselves also to the Lord. We submit ourselves to one another. You see that? You can't get to that if you don't have a thankful and joyful heart. And you can't get to the thankful and joyful heart if you're putting all this other nonsense in your heart. If you're not making melody to the Lord, right? Okay, let me show you something real quick. Go to Acts chapter 2. I'm just going to hit a couple of passages real quick. I just want to show you that as a Christian, sometimes people will, will frown when you tell them that we as believers, Baptists, believe that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of truth, but you also need to fill yourself with the Spirit. People will say, well, ain't I filled all the way to the top when I, when I get saved and then I never have to fill myself again? No, no, the Bible is going to show you. Take a look here. and Read Acts chapter 2 verse 4. I want you to see. This is where the Holy Spirit comes down and they all get filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's read verse 4. Acts 2 verse 4. Okay, would we agree that at this point they're all filled with the Holy Ghost, right? Yeah. So let's say the cup is full, right? Yeah. Okay, go over to chapter 4. Read for me verse 8. Peter, who has boldness. Okay, watch this. Somebody who is filled with the Holy Spirit. See how he acts. Read verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people... Okay, let me ask you a question. Why would the Bible, why would the Holy Spirit even tell us that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit if by default every Christian you saved was filled with the Holy Spirit? You see what I'm saying? It, then it might as well have just told us then Peter who was saved. No, it says Peter full of the Holy Ghost, right? Okay, go down to verse, read for me verse 31. These are the same disciples who were filled with the Holy Ghost back in Acts chapter 2 verse 4 gets filled with the Holy Ghost again in Acts 4.31. Do you see that? Isn't that interesting? Let me, let me, let me show you something. Go to chapter 5. You'll see there that Ananias and Sapphira comes in and Peter asks Ananias, that says to him that he has filled his heart with Satan. See, we can see that. It's verse 4, 5, 6, down about. Three. Verse 3. Yeah, let's read that verse. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back the part of the price of the land? Now, a lot of people who believe you can lose your salvation, they'll say, well, he, lost his, he, he was lost. Well, then how can he lie to the Holy Ghost? You see, he's a Christian. He's, he's part of the church. He's one of those people who got saved back in, in Acts chapter 2. And now he's got his heart filled with Satan. Yeah, believers can fill their heart with a lot of the same things that unbelievers can fill their heart with. Let me show you. I'll, I'll skip through this. But if you go to Acts 9, you'll see that that is where Saul of Tarsus gets saved. And he gets hands laid on him. And it says, and he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He gets filled with the Holy Ghost, right? So Paul gets filled with the Holy Ghost. Go to all the way down to Acts 13. Let me show you. Acts 13. Just eyeball it real quick. The Jews there in verse 45. What did they fill themselves with? In verse 45? Envy. Envy. See, that's something you can fill yourself with is envy, Okay. But let's go down. Read for me verse 50. I want you to see there's persecution against Paul and Barnabas. Well, look at this. But the Jews, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women, and the chief 
chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their boats. Okay, so we know we're dealing with Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas, he got saved back there in, in Acts chapter 2, down about. He would have been among those disciples that were filled again with the, the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Now Barnabas, take a note here, he gets persecuted, right? With, alongside with Paul. Take a look what they do. This is another, another thing that you can do in order to fill yourself up with the Holy Ghost. Read verse 51. Okay, so they shake off the dust of their feet, basically putting it behind them, right? Yep. And they came to Iconia, who's, who's over there? Brevdan. Mm-hmm. Fellow Brevdan is over there. So they fellowship with believers. They, 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 they basically shake the dust off. How about instead of having fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, you shake them off like dust of your feet and you go and have fellowship with believers. Do you see that? And look at what happens in 52. Read for me verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Again, they are filled with the Holy Ghost. But it comes after they are filled with joy, right? They filled with joy and they get filled with the Holy Ghost. So how do you as a believer, how do you get yourself filled again with the Holy Ghost? Is you put the right music in your ears, psalms. Godly music, right? Music that plays God. You can, you, you play, you fill yourself with thanksgiving to the Lord. You're going to get joy in your heart. And then you submit yourself one to another. You have fellowship with other believers. And that's how you become filled with the Holy Spirit again. It's, it's, it's something that you have to prayerfully consider. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I want to be having so much oil flowing out of me that my lantern will start burning brighter and brighter and brighter. And I, want, I want to be so filled with the Holy Spirit of God that people will think I'm a nut. That they will think, that, is that guy drunk? No, he's just extremely bold. What is he? He's an endangered species. He's a spirit-filled Christian. That's what you want to be. And you don't want to be ashamed for being that. And that's what we see in those seven lamps burning with fire in front of the throne of God. So let's make that our mission this week. Let's see if we can fill ourselves with, with, with the Spirit of God. Let's do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord God, you're so good to us. We love you. We praise you, Lord. We ask you to help us this week as we fill ourselves with joy, fill ourselves with thankfulness, Lord, and fill ourselves with your Spirit, Lord. That's what we want. That's what we pray for. And that's what we ask, Lord. Please help us, God. We praise you now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church. Please visit us at www.shepherdsgrace.org for more information.